So sorry that we're a little late getting started this morning. The reason for that is I was wrestling with D2L and iClicker to try and get your grades uploaded. Actually, not the problem was not the grades, but it was the trying to get the registrations that you have all done, of course, on D2L, getting them to talk to my computer somehow that's still not working completely properly. I may have to go through and do it all by hand, but it will get worked out. So um, those of you um, who weren't here on Friday, um, registration apparently doesn't work on the link if you go to it in Safari, but if you go to Chrome or any of the other browsers, it does work, which may be why I was having trouble this morning. We'll see whether that's the case or not. Um, yeah? I would go ahead and do it on the form on D2L as well, um, just to be on the safe side. The problem is I, the comp program doesn't work doing both, and the uploading only works through the D2L link. Okay. So at least in theory, this means you get your clicker scores really fast, right? Of course, you still don't have them. So this was the theory. This is how it was supposed to work this term, but so be it. Um, any other questions about the, sort of the clicker stuff? I'm, I'm working on it. Um, hopefully by the end of the week it, that will all be taken care of. Um, I do have scantrons for people who would like to pick them up as well. Um, and we have clicker questions today as well. So <clears throat> the first clicker question is where does poliovirus usually replicate? Neurons, gastrointestinal tract, upper respiratory tract, lower respiratory tract, the oceans. Probably could have given you a minute for this one and it would have been just fine. Five, three, two, one, zero. Uh, so <clears throat> where does enterovirus D68 replicate? Yep, respiratory tract. Um, what's it, what is it called? Which is really confusing, it's called an enterovirus. Um, what's polio? Enterovirus. Where does it really replicate? In the GI tract. Yay, yes. <laughs> Correct. Um, what, about, what's the, um, what about neurons? Why not neurons? Uh, yeah, so um, causes disease clearly in neurons, but doesn't actually seem to replicate in neurons. Um, and certainly the major place that you're getting replication of poliovirus, one of the reasons why oral polio vaccine is so good is that it spreads through GI and then people get inoculated because they're in areas where there's some fecal oral transmission um, that's happening there. So <clears throat> it's our first one for today. Second one, oops, let's move forward. Yes, no, we'll do this then. If it will move, there we go. Um, how many open reading frames are there in rhinovirus genomes? One, three, five, sixteen, or twenty-three. Oops. Do I keep the results up? People like that? Good. Make, we, we can keep watching it if you like. Maybe this is another way of talking with each other, right? Instead of talking to each other, you can actually see what's going on here. I've never tried this before. It's kind of fun. <laughs> it's like, do you believe everybody in the class or not? See if your clicker works. It's a good way to see if your clicker works. It only counts the last one, so you've got another 50 seconds to check it. <laughs> 
So try, try another one. Try another one and go back to what you think. Make sure your clicker works. Yeah, press around the button, see what happens. Twenty seconds. Make sure you change your boat back, <laughs> or leave it as it is because, you know, hundred percent of your classmates could be wrong. <laughs> Five, four, three, two, one. Ah. So, what does Stedman think? Yay! Yes. Um, and the, um, the key here is, is what? Is that it's a polyprotein. And they're all polyproteins. And we'll see today that's true for the flaviviruses as well. So that's, oh, come on. Let me do this right so actually people do get the scores. That would help. So <clears throat> with that, adios, those of you who have to leave. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about flaviviruses. And the <clears throat> big picture with the flaviviruses I always like to think of flaviviruses as basically enveloped picoRNA viruses because they are extremely similar to the picoRNA viruses in terms of their genome structure, in terms of their replication, in terms of how all of that works. It turns out that they do cause some pretty nasty diseases and that's what we're going to spend sort of the first 20 minutes or so talking about. Um, particularly yellow fever and dengue, a little bit about hepatitis C. There's been some really amazing developments literally in the last six months in terms of treatment for hepatitis C. Um, been really, really impressive. So again, you know, these are small positive strand enveloped RNA viruses, but again, I like to think of them really very much like enveloped picoRNA viruses. There are a couple of things which are different as far as these flaviviruses and the picoRNA viruses, and most of that has to do with the fact that they're enveloped. <laughs> um, so entry is going to be different. It's not going to be forming a pore through the outside membrane. Um, they, of course, have to pick up their envelope somehow. Those envelope proteins are going to be different. Um, cellular proteases, which are also used in terms of breaking down the polyproteins, so it's not just the viral proteases that are involved there. And of course, membranes have a lot to do with it. Pretty standard outline. Um, this is, forget which one of these this is, pretty small. I think this one's West Nile, if I remember correctly. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about the origin, what some of the diseases are that are caused by these flaviviruses. And again, you know, viruses get this bad rap because they're always causing disease, and so that's what we know mostly about them. Um, then we'll talk about some of the structure. And again, the structure mostly has to do with the membrane. Otherwise, the inside is pretty much exactly the same. Uh, binding and entry is actually really kind of cool. These things go from a very curious form, and we already looked at the dengue fusion uh, video before. But the receptor binding proteins actually start out kind of lying flat down on the viral membrane, and then really pop out to form these trimeric structures. They're dimers in the membrane and pop out to form these trimeric structures um, when you have entry that takes place. Um, replication and translation are basically identical to the picoRNA viruses that we talked about last time. Uh, assembly, of course, is a little different because we've got the membrane on the outside, and then we'll talk a little bit about release. But the main thing here, of course, is that you know, these guys cause a bunch of nasty diseases. And we're going to talk about these four here, yellow fever, dengue, West Nile, and hepatitis C. Hepatitis C is, is kind of an outlier relative to these other three, partly because we didn't know very much about it until really quite recently, uh, but also all of these viruses, both the standard flaviviruses and the pestiviruses, which are basically about the same thing, um, these guys only infect animals other than primates, and these ones infect primates as well, uh, <clears throat> is that these guys are all vector-borne diseases, and we'll talk much more about vectors as we move along here. But just the main reason that people care about these hemorrhagic fevers. So what's hemorrhagic fever? 
fever, gross. Yeah, it's a great term. It's rather gross. Um, so <clears throat> what about these flaviviral diseases? Again, um, almost all of them are vector-borne diseases, also known as arboviruses. And so when you go to the CBC, CDC, excuse me, um, Center for Disease Control, their arbovirus group. That's the group which is concerned with these vector-borne diseases. And again, yellow fever, dengue, and West Nile. And I like this magnification here of the mosquito because most of it really is about the mosquito. And a lot of the, I think, really good research that's going on in terms of understanding a lot of these flaviviral diseases, in fact, a number of other diseases as well, um, has to do with what's happening to the virus when it's in the mosquito. Not so much what's happening to the virus when it's in a human, but what's happening in terms of the mosquito. And so some really interesting aspects about the mosquito part of the virus life cycle that we're just slowly beginning to understand. And there's a whole group of people in you know, various different places who have massive mosquito colonies. Talk about work I don't want to do. Uh, but really trying to understand exactly how these things are, are working with each other. So we'll start out looking at yellow fever. Um, yellow fever probably arose in Africa in the 17 to 1800s, but <clears throat> was then relatively quickly transferred to the New World, mostly because of all the plantations in the U.S. at the time, and the disease was brought with them. Ended up killing off lots of not only slaves, but slave owners, et cetera. Uh, a lot of the early history of the United States actually has to do with yellow fever and lots of people dying um, because of that. Uh, the big problem, hepatitis, that's why it's yellow fever. Um, get the yellowing. I had a bunch of gross pictures that I pulled off the, uh, the web, which I decided not to include. Um, but basically, that's the, that's the idea here. So hepatitis is really um, sort of the main issue here, and multiple organ, fa organ failure. Um, used to be um, that there were you know, literally tens to hundreds of thousands of this every year in the developed world, but mostly through vector control, that was taken care of. And that was you know, emptying the swamps. Why have Washington, D.C. where Washington, D.C. is? It's a swamp. And swamps are where mosquitoes love to be. And so that was partly why it was really nastily diseased there. But even now, today, and we'll see in just a second, um, there are about 200,000 cases of yellow fever every year. And um, just did some back-of-the-envelope calculations, um, helped out by the vaccine insert from the vaccine company. And there have been six fatalities in the six years from 96 to 2002 um, for yellow fever infection. So, and there are lots more people, of course, who travel into yellow fever endemic regions. So uh, not something to be too terribly worried about, but um, that's still clearly endemic and not so much for us, but certainly in lots of parts of the developing world, it's a problem. Uh, but partly because yellow fever was a big problem in the U.S. and not so much in the Washington, D.C. area, but particularly um, further south, New Orleans and places like that, um, this became a big deal, and also Spanish-American War. People say that more of the American soldiers died of yellow fever than actually in the war itself. Um, so Walter Reed, um, U.S. Army, and a number of people were really thinking about trying to figure out what, in fact, was going on with yellow fever. Um, and they, they being the people working together with Walter Reed, um, many of you know the, the main sort of hospital is now Walter Reed uh, Medical Center um, just outside of D.C. It's all named because of this guy who was working on yellow fever. Um, and he was the one who showed that the vector really was the mosquito. And basically, you couldn't have human-to-human -human transmission, which was really bizarre. Usually, if you think about influenza, polio, anything like this, you have direct human-to-human -human transmission. But people didn't transfer it between themselves. But you'd have these big outbreaks. And what were that connected to? And eventually, again, they found that it was a mosquito. And the way they did that was by putting somebody who was infected in with mosquitoes or not with mosquitoes, and then seeing if they got infected, which is interesting. I don't think anyone would allow those kind of experiments to take place now. Uh, but <clears throat> that was found. And what was, I thought was pretty amazing is that it was found to be a viral disease in 1901. And you remember, viruses were just discovered when? 
late 1800s. So this is very, very early that people figured out that yellow fever was a viral disease. Um, and in 1905, it had been eliminated from the US. So four years between figuring out the virus and getting rid of it, which is really pretty amazing. Where you know, I think if they'd had Nobel Prizes, Walter Reed probably would have gotten one. You know, they didn't really have them at the time. Um, the other thing that people say about this <coughs> process and getting rid of mosquitoes, it allowed the Panama Canal to be built. Um, if they hadn't figured out that it was a viral disease and gotten rid of the mosquitoes, which apparently are still a big problem um, in Panama, it's going to be other diseases we're just about to talk about, um, that <coughs> probably never would have gotten built. Uh, what has kept yellow fever at bay, because we haven't been very good about mosquito control, um, was the development of a vaccine. But it was way later. So remember, 1905 gone in the US, way before vaccines. So you can actually control viral diseases without having any vaccine whatsoever, and just by controlling the vector in this case. Um, but you can't really control a vector throughout the whole world, and there are lots of places where there are a lot more mosquitoes. So um, in the 1930s, a vaccine was developed, and this vaccine was developed in exactly the same way we talked about attenuated for polio last time, by taking the virus, putting it into, in this case it was um, cell culture, growing up the virus, <coughs> infecting it into cell culture, and doing this multiple times, um, came up with the strain 17D, which is almost exactly the same as the wild type virus. We now have done the sequencing, of course, much after this was done. Um, 32 amino acid differences in the whole polyprotein. Um, is it the envelope? Who knows? Uh, one really nice thing about this particular vaccine, again, it's attenuated, so it replicates, just doesn't cause disease. It can be passed in milk, and so if moms are immunized, they can pass on this immunization. Um, this is what it looks like. Um, yellow fever vaccine, YF-vax, um, this is still being used today. Some of you may or may not recognize these three fingers, because um, they're actually <laughs> mine. Um, kind of hard to tell with the gloves. Um, we're, in fact, working on this in my lab right now. So that's so the the question is can the virus can the actual virion be transmitted or the just is it just antibodies? The answer is I don't know. Uh, it's a very small virus, so possibly it could be passed that way. What I do know is you get immunity, then, and I'm guessing that you usually the antibodies getting passed that doesn't generate immunity. So I'm guessing that there's some transmission there, but I don't actually know. That's a great question. So um, there. Are are, however, some problems with yellow fever vaccine. And that is down here, some of these um, adverse effects and you know, partly why I'm wearing the gloves here. Um, <clears throat> there are a number of fatalities that have been linked to immunization. And this is a classic problem with immunization, is there are fatalities that are associated temporally with vaccination. Is, are they actually caused by vaccination? That's where the big question comes up. So here, and again, I was going through um, the literature on this, there's about one in a thousand fatalities linked to immunization in infants less than four months. This sounds horrible. Like one in a thousand? That's just insane. Well, it turns out that most infants are not immunized under four months. So you have very, very, very few cases here. Where these infants were immunized is places where there's really high infant mortality anyway. Um, so the numbers here are, in fact, two that have been reported in the world. Worldwide. Yes, ever. <laughs> so um, whether this is actually really true is a very interesting issue. Probably more likely is this number down here, which is one in about 500,000 <coughs> doses where people have, in fact, had pretty nasty responses to this and nasty enough that they actually end up dying. Now, whether that is, again, directly linked to disease or not, um, or say directly linked to vaccination or not, is still a pretty open question. But because of that, um, this is a BSL-2 agent, even though it's used for vaccination purposes. Um, and people are trying to develop vaccines that have zero side effects. And so one in 400,000 know, seems pretty darn good to me anyway. 
but if you think about the number of people in the world who are exposed to yellow fever, that's still going to be a pretty high number. And so people are working on trying to deal with this number and get it to closer to one in a million, which seems to be about the goal, or even then less than that in terms of doses which are associated with it. And again, why is this such an issue? Because there are lots of parts of the world, particularly where lots of people are living, where yellow fever is endemic. And so these are all places, particularly in Western Africa. Most people didn't know where Guinea, Sierra Leone, and Liberia were until about a year ago. Uh, but many more people die of yellow fever in those countries than that other virus that we've been hearing a lot about that we'll talk about in, in a couple of weeks. Yeah? Exactly. Wet, humid, warm, perfect places for the mosquito to be. Yeah. And so, again, it's, it's much more about the control of the mosquito when you can yeah. than actually controlling through vaccination. But if you can get vaccination and get everyone, because the transmission that happens here, there's sort of two kinds of transmission that happens with yellow fever. One is from infected human to mosquito to infected human. And so that that is something that you can clearly control. If you can lower the disease in humans, that's fine. But there's also what's called a sylvatic cycle where you have non-human primates who are getting infected and then those getting pathological. Now, how are we going to get the non-human primates immunized is a very open question. It's probably not going to happen, at least not any time real soon. And there are quite a few non-human primates, although we're doing our best to kill them off, um, in a lot of these regions as well. So there's clearly also a, a cycle that's not going to be that easily controlled. I mean, in fact, probably the introductions of yellow fever, many of those come from the mosquitoes that have first interacted with a non-human primate and then transferred those to humans. Yeah? But even though this is an appendage, there's no halo effect that we're supporting this. Ah, because why not? Why is there no halo effect that happens with, like with polio? Yeah, well, so the vectors are mosquitoes. You have that extra step that has to happen, whereas with polio, you're spreading it quite nicely, directly, and then you can go. So there could, at least in theory, be a halo effect, but it's reduced by that mosquito level. Um, also, it turns out, and didn't put this in there, but has the, I think we may have this when we talk about dengue, uh, that the mosquitoes have to feed on an infected person when they have a relatively high amount of virus to get that virus to spread. And so there's also a certain window where you can get that. Okay, so that's um, yellow fever. Uh, not a really massive worldwide problem. Um, 200,000 a year. Most people actually don't come down with really nasty disease, um, but certainly something to be concerned about. On the other hand, um, dengue is much more of a problem. And dengue is very closely related virus to this, actually about four main serotypes of dengue. Um, estimates from the WHO and the CDC are hundreds of millions of infections a year, which is, that's a scary number. Uh, of that number, about 500,000 get dengue hemorrhagic fever. Just dengue fever is you know, not nice disease, but dengue hemorrhagic fever is a nasty disease. Um, and again, the whole, what we say, ugly. Was it ugly? Gross, gross, gross a much better term. Um, gross disease. And, you know, 22,000 people die every year um, from dengue hemorrhagic fever. And most of these are kids. So this is way more of a concern than yellow fever. And for that matter, things that are in the media as well, like Ebola, et cetera. So, um, and dengue kills way more people in West Africa than um, Ebola probably ever will. Yeah? No, these are the cases, the clear cases, yeah. So the, the actual number of deaths is, is relatively small for yellow fever. Another question here? Yeah. Oh, of these dengue hemorrhagic fever? That's a good question. I don't know. Um, I, there are a couple of links that I have in here where you can go and take a look at that. 
um, to WHO and CDC. Uh, uh, there we'll, we'll get back to the dengue hemorrhagic fever a little bit later on. It's actually a relatively small number if you think about it. So if we've got 100 million infections, of that, you know, 500,000 actually are getting the dengue hemorrhagic fever. One of the things that people think happens there is it's when you get your first dengue infection, it's actually usually not too bad. You don't have too much in the way of symptoms. But if you get a second one, which is of a different type, then it seems to be amplified. And that's where people seem to be getting the dengue hemorrhagic fevers from, is that second round of infection by one of the different types. Yeah? And that's where they have like a lot of infections? Yeah, so that's where we'll, yeah, that's a possibility. We'll talk about that when we get to the uh, entry um, in just a second, how that could be happening. Oh, well, that's just another quick thing here. Again, it's all about the mosquitoes, um, Aedes aegypti and Aedes albopictus. Um, these are the main mosquitoes which are transmitting it. Curiously enough, not all, not all mosquitoes are bad. It seems really bizarre to say that. <laughs> but certainly in terms of how you get transmission, and that has to do with the fact that these viruses do have to get into the mosquito and often have to replicate in the mosquito. And so just like you have with all the viruses that are infecting us, um, usually these viruses are pretty specific, so they're really pretty species specific. And so dengue only really replicates in um, the Aedes mosquito. Now, why do we care so much about dengue? Yeah, sure, there's a lot of numbers there, but it's also a clearly emerging virus. Prior to 1960, basically we had it in a couple of countries, and now it's through almost the whole tropics, um, and in fact there probably should be a lot more uh, red countries here in Africa as far as that's concerned. Um, another way of looking at this is if you think about where the mosquito is and where you have both the mosquito and dengue. Um, one thing you might notice here is at the tip of Florida there's ADs, but there doesn't seem to be too much in the way of dengue. Um, here right on the border, particularly southern Texas, um, ADs, but not too much dengue activity. Um, how long that's going to last is a really um, interesting question. There's this great interactive map that I'm not going to go to here, um, which has all the outbreaks basically listed for the whole world um, interactively, and you can go through and if you are interested in these things. Um, and again, we can probably find out which one of these are the pediatric um, numbers as well. But literally, every country in the world is reporting on that there. Uh, most cases here are pretty benign. Yeah, benign, yes, you're sick, but it's not really such a big deal. Uh, the symptoms come up about a week after you've been bitten, so making that connection between a mosquito bite and actually the disease can be kind of a problem. Um, and yeah, anywhere from about three to 10 days. Um, the mosquitoes also have to have the virus in them for a little over a week. Um, and that also is a really good indication on you know, what's happening in terms of that interaction, the replication of the virus in the mosquito. Um, one of the big problems is if you're infected and you don't have symptoms yet, you get bitten by a mosquito, that mosquito could actually have enough virus in it to transmit to someone else. And so you don't necessarily know that you're sick before you can be infectious, at least as far as transferring to the vector. Um, so that's, that's a big problem. Not surprisingly, because of all these numbers, uh, there's been a lot of interest in developing vaccines. And these are some of the vaccines, again, I pulled up from the CDC website, um, looking at <coughs> where these things are. The one that's furthest along is a vaccine from Sanofi Pasteur, which just passed, or actually they just published all their phase three clinical trials. And phase three is basically, does it work? You know, phase one is safety, phase two is original efficacy, and phase three is, you know, basically this is it. So I'm guessing that they will be submitting, that is um, Sanofi Pasteur, all of this data to the various regulatory agencies to try and roll out this vaccine. So people have been developing vaccines literally for, you know, probably almost since the 60s when all of this came out. So it's taken a rather long time to do this. Um, one of the really cool things that I think about this particular vaccine um, the Sanofi vaccine, they call it Chimerivax. Uh, and the way they made it was taking basically the yellow fever vaccine and recombinantly putting in, using genetically modified organisms, um, 
putting in the antigens from dengue onto the yellow fever backbone. Uh, and it seems to be working really pretty well. Uh, but and there are also a number of other uh, vaccines that are being used here, um, including this one down here, um, Envirogen, where they're doing phase two trials um, in places where it's endemic, but there are a couple of people up at OHSU who are very involved in, in fact, some of the clinical trials and, and trying to get some of this through. So there are a number of different vaccines that are all moving through the whole process here. So with any luck, we'll have decent vaccines in the next couple of years in terms of trying to look at dengue. Next one I wanted to talk about is West Nile. It's sort of the classic case of a emerging disease. Um, was originally discovered in Uganda in 1937, which is why it's called West Nile. Uh, first case was in New York City in 1999, and now in 2008, it's everywhere. And you can really closely follow the development as, of course, you know, the whole state of New York. Of course, it was down in the ports. And why was it introduced? How did that happen? Ships and what came with them? Not so much the birds, but this is also one of those vector-borne diseases. Mosquitoes. So, yes, mosquitoes were brought probably in ballast water. It's not entirely clear um, where those came from. And yes, um, it's been spread throughout the U.S. And no, Maine and North Carolina are not completely free of this. It's just in this particular year, there weren't that many cases that were there. Um, in 2012, which is the last time I took a look at this, um, these were all the disease cases. Yes, we also have a few in Oregon. Um, huge numbers right here <coughs> between uh, Minnesota and the Dakotas and Nebraska. Um, what also goes right through here? Lakes and what's this? Mississippi. So what do you find there? Lots of mosquitoes. And again, the, the lakes um, up here, any of you who lived in the Midwest or been there at all, I grew up right over here, right in the middle of where all these lovely mosquitoes are. Um, so <clears throat> that is uh, lots and lots of cases of West Nile. And all of these black dots here are human cases. Um, if you were to look at the bird cases, this whole thing would be black. Um, they're all over the place. And it turns out that West Nile is really not a big problem as far as humans are concerned. A few people die every year from it, but they have massive bird die-offs. And that's a huge problem for ornithologists and just also you know, what birds fit in the rest of the ecosystem. Um, and unfortunately, the Mississippi is also a major migration route for birds. Uh, so, and a lot of the lakes, particularly up in the upper Midwest here. Um, so there's some... Um, real issues and I think some changes that are going to be happening to ecosystems because of this um, one virus introduction. And again, there's a, a great interactive map that we could take a look at, but um, would take a while. And it's, it's just fun to click around all the places. You know, what was this case? What was this one? So <clears throat> the last one of these viruses I want to talk about is hepatitis C. And hepatitis C is a really interesting sort of exception relative to the other flaviviruses. This one actually can be transmitted from human to human, but with great difficulty. And unfortunately, what happens in the case of hepatitis C is it's direct transfer of blood for 99.9% .9 of the cases. Uh, what was interesting is that this was a virus that was discovered relatively recently um, because of people coming down with hepatitis and they had no idea what it was. And so really nice epidemiological studies and eventually finding a specific RNA that was present in all the people who had this disease and then from the RNA then finding the virus. And so this was uh, probably, I think, the first case of where people originally found the genome of the virus and then found the virus later. And so it was in looking at these you know, really strange RNAs that people with hepatitis C had, um, which for a long time was non-A, non-B hepatitis, because they knew about the viral cases for hepatitis A and hepatitis B, but non-A, non-B, which ended up being um, hepatitis C. So. <clears throat> comes from infected blood, and basically whenever there's 
large or repeat, repeated percutaneous exposures. IV drug use, transplantations, and to some extent transfusions before you had uh, good control of the blood supply. Uh, there was still in 2007 about 17,000 new cases, so it still spread almost all of these in IV drug users, so sharing needles. Uh, there's about a 1 to 5 percent fatality rate for hepatitis C, usually rather later in life, which um, is also not terribly surprising that people are very interested in this because people have birth dates between 45 and 65, and that includes me, right at the end of that, um, are five times more likely to have hep C than anybody after that, and mostly that's because the blood supply has gotten much better. You know, people have now been screening because we discovered this virus and we can now screen it. Um, until extremely recently, um, 40 to 80 percent success rate in therapy using interferons and ribavirin, and those are not really critical. Um, literally until two years ago, when this drug came on the market, um, Solvadi, it's an inhibitor of NS5B that we'll talk about in just a second, it's a viral polymerase, approved in December 2013, and probably the most successful blockbuster drug to appear in the last 10 years. Um, $2.27 billion worth of this drug have been sold since December of 2013. And um, you can do the math, that's not a very long time. So literally billions of dollars a year have been um, sold of this. Partly because um, these guys have done so well, um, there's competitors, and this one was literally approved 4th of November last year. Um, this is now a NS34A inhibitor and we'll see exactly what those guys are in just a second. Um, the big controversy, if you want to call it that about these, is how much they cost. So Solvati, for 12 weeks, cost $84,000. And Elysio, um, much cheaper at $66,360. Um, if you have liver disease, which is how most people notice that they've got hepatitis C, um, you need 24 weeks, and this ends up being you know, closer well, it's not quite a house in Portland anymore, but um, certainly other parts of the world now cost much of a house to have this disease. So there's, pardon? Let's say Ohio, for, for instance. Yeah. <laughs> or Michigan, exactly. We're, we've got West Nile too, so you get both of them. Uh, so <clears throat> this has become a, a big uh, concern because it turns out most of the people here are coming down with disease much later in life. It turns out you can have hep C for your whole life and never have a problem. It's also where we have really good diagnosis because, again, it's all through the molecular diagnosis for doing this. Hep C is not just in the developed world. It's clearly in the developing world as well. None of them are going to be able to afford this stuff. So that's another issue that we could spend a lot longer talking about. But, you know, cost of drugs here is really pretty amazing. But the success rates are fabulous. 98% cures. They work extremely well. So, okay, how do you balance these kinds of things, you know, in a private healthcare system, et cetera? So there's some interesting and not easily solvable questions about this. Yeah, here in the US. Yeah, so these, yeah, these, these drugs work amazingly well, um, as opposed to, I'll back up here real quick, you know, the, the 40 to 80% success, that wasn't really very good. These are 98 plus percent of, like, curing. of curing, completely gone, yeah, which is pretty amazing, yeah, works extremely well. Yeah, in the back, yeah, we'll go back. So yeah, the question is, why is it so expensive? And the answer to that is, um, ask the companies. Um, they, well, yeah, because they can, which is one thing. People are afraid of you know, dying from hep C, certainly. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, it's a, is it a supply and demand? Is it a development issue? Um, if you, again, ask the patients, you know, yes, I, I'll pay basically anything so that I don't die of liver disease, although a lot of them don't. 
um, and um, how much did it cost to develop the actual um, drugs, et cetera. Strangely enough, um, I sat next to somebody from Gilead on the plane once. I'm flying into Portland when I got bumped to business. And I didn't pay for the business class, but she was still there. Um, she said she left the company because there was too much money flying around. She thought it was really getting a little out of control. So I thought it was really kind of interesting. <laughs> yeah. Why can't I get her to sponsor my research? <laughs> yeah, here. Yeah, so one of the things, so the question is, you know, why is it so expensive? Again, the same kind of thing. And I don't know exactly what the structure is, but these are small molecules. And um, they work really well as inhibitors, which we will eventually talk about when we talk about the molecular biology of this. So I'll take your two questions, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, no, it is, I've, I've heard that it is a very good radio lab. Yeah. Say it's ad, that is a that is a gr right. That's a great question, and I don't know. Do you know? Okay. Yeah. No. And that's partly no. These are this is the sticker price. How many people pay sticker prices for cars or for for drugs? This may be a, an open question too. So that's why I also had you know, in theory, how much it costs the two point two billion dollars worth. Um, that's how much actually gets paid for it is another open question. OK, so let's talk about the interesting stuff. Forget the disease. Um, what's actually causing these diseases and, and the, the cool viruses that are involved in the process? Um, basically, again, these are enveloped picoRNA viruses. Uh, a lot of people say they kind of look like golf balls. Um, certainly, the cryo-EM um, looks a lot like that. Uh, nucleocapsid, regular, T equals 3. And this is not a pseudo T equals 3. It's just one protein. It's the capsid protein inside this envelope. But this looks a lot like a naked virus. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't really look like an enveloped virus because those envelope proteins, which you can see here in red, green, and blue, basically sort of cover the membrane surface. They're really um, packed down on top of this. They're, however, not arranged in a normal pseudo-equivalent um, process. Each of these are the envelope proteins. But you know, here we've got nice five, but that's not a nice six. And we've got these two here as well. So it's clearly not a quasi-equivalent structure that goes together there. Uh, this is a cross-section of one of these golf balls. Um, you've got the envelope protein here on the outside, uh, matrix protein holding that envelope onto the membrane, and the capsid protein right in the middle. So it's really you know, very compact structure, even though it's this envelope structure. And I did pull this from a German website. That's why it says the uh, Hull membrane here. So, um, so that's what the capsid protein looks like. This comes from um, Steve Harrison's lab. Um, I've given you a couple of links to Steve Harrison's work before. Um, crystal at harvard.edu. But this is really different than the classic envelope protein receptor binding protein. Usually those are what? Chimers. They stick out like spikes on the outside. This guy's lying down flat on the surface. So how the heck do you get something lying down flat on the surface to actually then interact with the receptors and then pull the two membranes together? And this has been a really open question for a long time. Turns out that the receptor binding is over here, you know, this red subunit here, um, this green subunit over here, again, also flat down on the surface of the cell. How do they get in? Um, people think it's receptor-mediated endocytosis. They don't actually know still, at least when I put the slide together, exactly what the receptor is. Still a very open question. Um, but this brings up this antibody-dependent enhancement. And so as people think, at least for dengue, that if you have antibodies to one of these viruses, just antibody binding to the envelope protein helps it get picked up by cells, which I guess is really kind of bizarre. And evolutionarily, how that could happen is, is not entirely clear. But um, it does seem to be the case is when you have been infected by one of the four forms of dengue and you have antibodies to it, the second form gets picked up a lot faster. 
and then gets enter, enters inside the cell. How does that take place? Well, it turns out that this dimer, which I showed you before, and you can see it up here as well on the, in the flat side, when it gets to low pH, so again, similar kinds of things to what happens with influenza hemagglutinin, you have a change in the structure and it goes from dimer to trimer and actually reforms into this structure here that looks really, really similar to the trimeric structures that you have with things like influenza hemagglutinin, as we'll see later, HIV, and a lot of the other receptor binding proteins that you have on viruses. So when you have this low pH environment, you have this complete change in the structure and oligomerization state, which pulls these ends up here together. Another way of looking at this is when you have a change in pH. So normally your receptor binding proteins are here lying down on the membrane. Change in pH exposes this fusion peptide. Fusion peptide, just like we talked about with influenza, nice hydrophobic amino acids. They stick into the host membrane, which is up here at the top. Then you have other conformational changes which pull the two membranes together and eventually have membrane fusion, release of the genome. And this is that video again. It's exactly the same video that we've looked at before. I just wanted to throw it up here um, as <clears throat> a uh, comparison purpose because we'll, I want to talk more about some of the genome in just a second. Um, what does the genome look like? One big open reading frame, just like poliovirus and the rhinoviruses. A couple of differences. Um, one is that it doesn't have a protein bound at one end. It has a cap. Looks like a normal cap, but how are caps normally formed? One of my favorite enzyme, one little transferase, um, in the nucleus. But it's an RNA virus replicating in the cytoplasm. Where does it get its cap from? Hmm. Interesting. We'll see in just a second. No poly A tail. Huh. Okay, well, how does it protect the end of its genome? Well, it turns out that this end of the genome is complementary to this end of the genome. So it forms a circular RNA. How do you normally form RNAs that are getting translated inside a eukaryotic cell? You get circles that form between the poly A binding protein and and <laughs> EIF4F, all of the cap binding complex. So it makes this loop structure. So here, the loop is actually formed due to base pairing interactions, and that seems to protect, at least to some extent, the 3 prime N from the nasty exonucleases that would love to come and chew it up. Um, but there's also a stem loop structure, very similar to what you have in most of the rhinoviruses. Polio is actually kind of the exception in having that poly A tail at the end. Um, usually there's a secondary structure which is present at the end. So both of those things seem to protect the end. Just like you have with the picoRNA viruses, you have your structural proteins down here at the 5 prime end, these non-structural proteins here at the 3 prime end of the genome. Relatively big genome for an RNA virus, about 11,000 nucleotides in length. There are Multiple proteases, again, just like you have with the picoRNA viruses, NS3 and NS2B. NS stands for non-structural, exactly. Um, and these numbers here are really confusing, but they just labeled them from the 5 prime end to the 3 prime end. We also have cellular proteases, which are critical for how this virus functions, um, both the furin peptidase and the signal peptidase. We'll take a quick look at where those are in just a second. Uh, no, I don't expect you to remember oops, all of these. Hang on, this is a, this is a wrong table. Oops, oh well. Hmm. Something strange happens when I transfer this from one computer to the other. Well, okay, so there are three circles here in terms of the three proteins that I think you should be remembering. Which, of course, here are invisible on this particular slide. So, um, and they're invisible on my computer as well. But fortunately, I remember what they are. Um, <laughs> and they are the <clears throat> NS5, which is the viral replicase, so the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And it also has the activity of methylating the end of the genome, the 5' end, 
So the cap actually is made by NS5. And NS5 is the target of the Gilead drug, Solvati. So NS5 um, is important here. We just mentioned, um, actually back here, um, NS3 in particular, which is the main viral protease. And I give you one guess. What was it? Oli, CO, I forget, target? The protease. NS3, exactly. So um, these are probably the most successful designer drugs, as it were, because people looked at the structures of these proteins, how these proteins worked, and then designed drugs that would inhibit their structures. And so that's where that comes from, and that's why it's so expensive to develop them, and that's why they're so expensive to buy. We'll leave it at that. Um, this one up here is the PRM protein, so the pre-matrix protein that we'll look at in, in just a second here. So that's what these three circles are supposed to be here. Um, are they right in the notes that were posted? Yeah. Pardon? Yeah, so E and PRM, well, of course, the polyprotein, so these are where those are at. So, see, I'm actually pretty good at remembering what's in my notes. <laughs> Thank you for correcting me on that. So um, how do these guys replicate? First, we have presumably receptor-mediated endocytosis, but a big question mark here in terms of what that receptor is. Um, the spikes sticking out here I don't like very much because they're actually flat down on top of the membrane. When you do, however, have this change in the pH, which is what happens in those endosomes, then they form the spikes, and then you have the conformational change which <clears throat> pulls this together. And in fact, the um, capsid, which is that C protein here, releases the genome, and we have polyprotein synthesis, et cetera. Um, this happens all in the cytoplasm. Then you have targeting to the endoplasmic reticulum, which is where we have replication. So again, not unlike the case for the picoRNA viruses, these guys like to bind to membranes. Again, NS. <coughs> NS5 does this. It's a really cool paper about three weeks ago on the structure of NS5 and how it interacts here. Um, but we're not going to get into that. Um, interacts with the membrane, replicates. And then you have formation of the nucleocapsid. So the C protein makes its P equal 3 nucleocapsid structure. And then what happens is you have budding into the ER. This is really bizarre. Normally you think you're getting budding that's happening out here. Um, but here, this nucleocapsid, it's got the genome on the inside, the capsid protein on the outside, that then buds into the ER. So you end up with a vesicle inside the ER, which is your infectious particle. That then gets transported through the Golgi out to the membrane, the plasma membrane of the cell, and so then you fuse those vesicles. So basically it's a vesicle that has an enveloped virus on the inside of it. So there's really two layers of membranes which are there. So the viral membrane, the envelope, and then the cell membrane as well. So how does this processing and assembly take place? Um, it's all through <coughs> processing of the polyprotein. This is now the lumen of the ER. This is the cytoplasm on this side. If you look at the structural proteins, you remember what's at the five prime end of the genome, We've got our cap here, the C protein, that's the nucleocapsid, and then the various envelope and matrix proteins that are present here on the outside. So these are going to be outside eventually the virus particle once it's released. They get inserted into the membrane because it's got these wonderful transmembrane domains. The matrix protein's got a transmembrane domain. The envelope protein has a transmembrane domain. And then you have all these non-structural proteins, um, which are here in the ER. Um, you don't need these. These are now actually now eventually discarded because you know, in the ER of the lumen, we've already replicated enough of our genome to get translation, et cetera, of your polyprotein. So <clears throat> here, C protein will bind to your genome, make your nucleocapsid. Then you have signal peptidases, 
So this is now your cellular proteases that are required for replication that cleave off the envelope protein, cleave off this pre-membrane protein, and then the non-structural proteins. You have pre-membrane protein, the E protein, as this preformed particle, and you can also think of this as like a provirus, is being transported up through the Golgi and getting out to the plasma membrane, that's where you have this final cleavage event that takes place, the furin peptidase. Furin peptidase is just in the Golgi, and so it's not in the ER. It's as the virus particle is being moved out to the outside. And so this is the way that, again, to totally over-anthropomorphize, the virus controls that it only is going to be active once it's on its way out. So while you have all this assembly that's going on in the ER, you don't want to be interacting with membranes there. You don't want to be getting into endosomes. You don't want to be messing up all the cellular processes there. You want to make sure that this virus has a chance to get out as a virion and then be infectious. And so that last step is going to be the, the furin peptidase um, as it goes through there. So as a reminder here, and this is basically that table again, but now I've put them in red. Uh, <clears throat> for the non-structural proteins, um, these are all really interesting ones, but the ones we care about are the ones in red um, because they're also the ones that are being targeted by these drugs. NS3 is not only a protease, but it's also an RNA helicase. Why do you need RNA helicases? Yeah, for secondary structure, but probably more importantly, when you've got your two genome strands, your positive strand and your negative strand, um, they're coming together. So it's, you know, these inhibitors of NS3 are inhibiting the protease, but they're also inhibiting the helicase activity and these triphosphatase activities. Um, NS4AB is not critical. NS5 is the replicase, but also the capping enzyme. And so this is the other one of your targets for um, these different drugs, which, is be, which are, um, are being used here. So again, how does it get out? Assembly at the ER, you have this C protein, which is stuck in, and I should you know, go back here, um, right here at the envelope. And you remember when we did that cross section right at the beginning, at least of this section, um, you could see that the capsid was right underneath the membrane, and so basically sort of this membrane sandwiched in between the envelope and the capsid proteins, um, and that's due to you know, this interaction here of the capsid protein at its C-terminus. Uh, genome plus C protein then is associated with the ER, gets into, sorry, into the ER, and then finally, here in the Golgi is where you have the furin peptidase, which will chop that matrix protein in such a way that this virion is now infectious. You have normal vesicle release, and now we have a mature infectious virion that can go off and infect some other cell. So there's, um, you can take a look at the animations. Again, most of these we've looked at already. If you want to go and look at some of these interactive maps, please go ahead, and otherwise, I'll see you on Wednesday for big RNA virus.